There is a prevailing notion in society today that life is a game that you either win or lose. And any behavior that you do to win is justified. But if you behave ethically and you lose, you're a chump. Today we're going to be talking about where this notion comes from and is it true? I'm Julie Hartman and this is Timeless. friends and welcome to the show where I talk about timeless, eternal, moral, intellectual subjects. I have talked about on this show owls, the Iraq war, uh, famous art and music. I mean the topics that we cover range uh, really across the board. But today we're going to be talking about a particular moral subject that has come to really interest me. And of course, if you heard the introduction, you know it's this notion that life is a game. Now, this concept was first introduced to me just about a year or two ago when I was a senior in college. And so, specifically, there was this guy who I went to school with, who I knew from afar, I didn't know him terribly well, but he had this reputation of being, I'm struggling to find PC or uh, uh, PG, I should say, words to describe him. He was known as being kind of a blankety blank, just a user, he was not a nice person. And again, I knew him from afar, I didn't know him very well, but one day we were all sitting in a common room, just uh, about uh, 10 or, or 20 of us hanging out. And this individual was openly bragging about cheating on an exam. He was saying that he had uh, sat with some of his buddies in a V formation in an exam, which I had never heard of, but it's so that they could look at each other's paper without being I guess, caught by the professor. And this guy was talking about it so openly and bragging about it, like it was something to be proud of. And interestingly, the people around him were sort of listening to him and not reacting and were sort of smiling and nodding as if it was totally normal. And so I, the contrarian, cut in and I said to this guy, I said, why are you talking about this in a celebratory way? Why is this like something that you are proud of? And he answered this way to me. He said, well, life is a game. You either win the game or you lose the game. And you have to do what you have to do to win. Because he said everyone else is doing what they have to do to win. And again, as interesting as it was, what, what this individual was saying, it was also really interesting to witness people around the room who were kind of nodding or not reacting and not wanting to challenge him. And so after that day, I was really meditating on this idea, and I have come to realize that this was not just a prevailing notion among this one individual or at my university, but it actually has come to be a prevailing societal notion writ large. Even if you look at people like the Kardashians who have gotten famous for no reason, we no longer admire people for the reasons that they become famous. We just admire them for having money and fame because they played the game well. It doesn't matter if they pimp themselves out. It doesn't matter if they have no talent. They played the game well, and so we should admire that they worked it and got to the top. Actually, I think that people nowadays admire people like the Kardashians even more because they didn't get there uh, through their own talent. They got there through this idea of finesse that is seen as such a virtue nowadays as opposed to honesty and discipline and hard work. Even if you look on Instagram, people buy likes and buy followers, and it's this interesting thing where people have no shame about it. They're very open about doing it. It's very obvious when you see someone bought followers because they have 20,000 followers, but then you look at their posts and they only have like three people commenting. So it's very obvious, but people don't even care that they're being obvious because again, they're playing the game. And we live in a society where if you're playing the game, then you're doing something right. Even if you look on CNN or NBC or Fox News and look at the things that the media reports on pertaining to presidential elections, it's all about gerrymandering. It's all about what candidates can do to get more votes or to win more people over. They don't talk about issues. Again, they talk about ways to win. I remember when I played water polo, 
I would always have girls that would immediately, when we started the game, girls on the opposing team, I mean, grab my suit under the water where the ref couldn't see. And I would have like some players try to like talk smack to me in the water and they would like hold my suit and they'd be like, can you handle it? Why aren't you doing this back? And it was just so interesting because I remember thinking, first of all, I never responded to them because I just wanted to act like it didn't bother me and just let them do their thing. But I just remember thinking, you think that you are playing the game well, and actually the fact that you are immediately grabbing my uh, suit shows your fraudulence. It shows that you are weak and undisciplined and you haven't worked hard enough that you can't play the game clean. You have to immediately play the game dirty and go and grab the suit and cheat and do things that are against the rules because you haven't worked hard enough. And I remember thinking, you know what? Not only am I not going to grab this girl's suit back and like break the rules otherwise, I am going to beat her and I'm going to do it the clean way to show that I am that competent, I am that hardworking, and I am that good, that I am going to prevail over her weakness. And so when this guy at Harvard was talking so openly about cheating, I just remember thinking you're basically just admitting that you're lazy and you're stupid and you're undisciplined. It's just so funny that he thought that that was something to be celebrated. But even when I was playing water polo, I had coaches that would spend a significant chunk of practice time trying to teach us how to grab other people's suits under the water. Because my coach subscribed to the idea that, well, it's a game and people are going to break the rules. So instead of you playing the right way, you should learn how to break the rules too. So my point is, this is something that is pervasive in our society now. And I really want to talk about with you where this has come from and if it is true that life is a game. And even in some ways, if it's true that we should view it as such and behave in ways to curry favor and manipulate things to our benefit. I want to start with an insight that someone who grew up on a farm <laughs> actually imparted to me, and it really changed the way that I look about honesty and certain virtues. He made the terrific point of saying that, of course, cheating and lying and manipulating isn't confined to affluent or white collar people, but really it is more pervasive among affluent people and white collar professions. If you look at those who do blue collar work or those who, uh, who engage in what is conventionally known in American society as honest work, it is much harder to cheat your way out of something. It is much harder to BS your job. If you look, for instance, at a farmer, this, this man who grew up on a farm, he was, he was telling me, when I went back to the farm at night, my father would ask me if I had closed the chicken coop. And he said, I had better tell my father the truth because the next day it would be very clear if I had closed the chicken coop or not because the chickens would escape or a dog would come in and eat them. In other words, I couldn't lie because the consequences were right around the corner and immediate for all to see. Similarly, if you look at a bus driver, a bus driver maybe can sort of cut corners by, I don't know, taking the money from the people who hand over the dollar bill and pocketing it for himself. Of course, there are always way to, ways to cheat, but you can't cheat driving people from one place to another. There's just no way to finesse that. You either do it or you don't. If you're a housekeeper, of course, you could steal people's clothes, you could steal people's money, you could do um, a job to you know half of your effort. But it's very clear whether you made a bed or you didn't make a bed. So that's why middle class virtues are called middle class virtues. This is why blue collar work is sort of colloquial, colloquially, at least in the past, referred to in America as honest work, because in those jobs, honesty and diligence were not just virtues, they were requirements. And that is so different from going to a fancy university or being in a white collar job or working in finance or pressing send for a living. And by the way, perhaps I'm, I'm speaking about this in disparaging terms. I don't disparage that kind of work or, or that kind of life. I do that kind of life if you do it honestly. But what I'm trying to point out is that it is much easier to cut corners when you aren't doing day-to-day -day laborious tasks that you just cannot BS. So that framework of seeing cheating and lying as really tied up with affluence and privilege 
really sort of upended, upended my understanding of the world. And when that guy who I went to college with was bragging about cheating, I thought, you know, you, and of course this guy was super woke and claimed to, you know, want to help people who were less fortunate. I'm like, you just, you are just screaming affluence and privilege right now. The fact that you can just BS your way through Harvard by cheating and then sit and brag about it as if it's something to be proud of. And so I think one of the main reasons why this idea that life is a game has become so in vogue and so popular is because today life is about condoning and legitimizing our impulses rather than controlling our impulses. And you see this everywhere. You see this, of course, with Lizzo saying that she is proud to be fat and that anyone who is disparaging her for being fat is fat phobic. She's in the Instacart commercial sitting in a bathtub eating Takis, eating burrito, eating, you know, eating a burger. Like this, this idea, if you want to be fat, it's empowering and good to be fat has so pervaded our culture instead of people wanting to say, hey, maybe you should control your weight and you know, obviously we shouldn't fat shame people who have problems or who are trying to work on themselves, but celebrating fatness is this total inversion of what we should be doing. Also, even if you look at hookup culture, I talk a lot about hookup culture on this show. The fact that you can just indulge your impulses and have one night stands with people without speaking to them the next day or treating them with common decency feeds into this impulse driven culture that we live in. Even if you look at this trans movement, of course there are some people who are born, I think, truly trans, but I think that is a small, small, small segment of the population. But now it has become the social contagion where if you want to identify as a woman, if you want to identify as a man, you want to identify as a donkey or a burrito or something, you can identify as whatever you want. Again, we live in this culture where all of our impulses are legitimized instead of controlled. Even when you hear people speak about, they say, tell your truth or speak your truth. That is such an asinine statement. There is no such thing as your truth or my truth. There is the truth. There is my opinion or your opinion. There is your subjective take or my subjective take. But the truth is this eternal universal thing that is above each and every one of us. And it just shows that nowadays we do not have certain values certain uh, things that we put higher than ourselves and that are objective. And of course, good behavior and bad behavior now falls into that category. Cheating is just seen as an alternative lifestyle choice. If someone is cheating, it's not that it's objectively bad, it's that they're doing whatever they need to do to win the game, to get through their semester. Or maybe they subscribe to a different set of moral values that we should just condone or be okay with instead of criticize. Even if you look at the ways that we talk about everyday things, our labels have become inverted. Legal versus illegal has, has sort of become inverted. Healthy versus unhealthy, I was talking about fat phobia. Normal versus abnormal. It is seen as totally normal for a 13-year-old to want to get a double mastectomy. That is completely abnormal. But again, these labels have been reversed. And now we see that things that are objectively abnormal are not only seen as normal, but are seen as noble. And that is what has happened here with cheating. It is not only legitimized, but it is celebrated. You're doing something well. You're finessing well if you're cheating. So in addition to this idea that we are not being told to control our impulses and that is what is creating this this push to to cheat to indulge our impulses we are also not being told why it is important to behave well to behave and lead your life in an ethical manner people see that as i don't know kind of corny or kind of soft to talk about why it's important to behave ethically but actually what's paradoxical is that there is a lot of self-interest in behaving well and not cheating and behaving ethically. Of course, 
things are right because they are eternally right. And things are wrong because they are eternally wrong. I think it is enough of an argument to say that cheating is wrong because it is morally wrong. And you should not do, indulge in these things that are objectively, universally, morally bad. But to use a more utilitarian approach, again, it actually is sort of selfish to behave well. Because life ultimately catches up with you. Someone who is cheating their entire way through medical school may, at the end of the day, get a degree without a lot of work and may end up getting a prestigious diploma or going on to work at a prestigious hospital. But when they are operating on the operating table, is that going to help them? How is that cheating going to work out for them? For them? It always catches up with you. That is the thing that people don't understand. Always, always, always. It may not catch up with people in the exact time frame that it should, or as severely that it should as it should, but I really believe that people get themselves and it always catches up. Similarly, when you cheat or you lie or you steal, even if it doesn't catch up with you directly, you are creating a society and a culture where people are more likely to do that because they see your example. And that does end up affecting you. What I should have asked that individual who I went to college with who was bragging about cheating, what I should have said to him is, do you one day want a cardiologist to operate on you who cheated his way through medical school? Do you one day want a lawyer to represent you who, who cheated on the bar exam? Do you want a pilot flying you who's, who cheated his way through pilot school? I mean, again, it's, it's, it's sort of self-interested to behave well because you are creating a society where other people are going to behave well. And obviously, when you, uh, you know, seek out a doctor or a lawyer or you interact in everyday life, you want people to behave well and treat you honorably. And also, this is something else that I was meditating on after that blankety blank was bragging about cheating. It is so characteristically privileged and frankly, as much as I hate to say it, American nowadays, to celebrate and condone corruption. Like we have no idea how awful corruption is that we can just say that finessing and BSing and playing the game is something that we should all celebrate and reward in other people. I went to college with a lovely person, he was in my dorm, who grew up in Nigeria. And it was so interesting, one night he told me that he had to take the SAT five times. And I said, wow, uh, you, I was in many classes with him. I was like, you're such a good test taker. Why did you have to take the, the SAT five times? And he said, oh, because my score was stolen repeatedly. He said, I got a 1600 the first time I took the SAT, but the people that, who were running the, uh, the test allowed certain wealthy individuals to bribe them and they sold my SAT score. And I was sitting there as this privileged American. I couldn't believe that something like that happened. But the more that you learn about the world, the more that you realize how astoundingly good we have it in the United States all across the board. Even when people talk nowadays about how racist American society is, of course racism exists. Racism has always existed and will always exist. It's a part of human nature. But we live in the least racist society in the world. And the proof of that, among other things, is that when people in the United States point to racism, they point to the most asinine things and they have to do so much mental gymnastics in order to be able to prove that racism is rampant. When people say that individuals who say that uh, they don't see color are racist, first of all, that statement that you don't see color is actually the least racist statement that you could say. But the fact that you're even pointing to something like that as evidence of racism shows what a tolerant society that you live in. Similarly, when women talk about the patriarchy that exists in the United States, what do they point to? They point to mansplaining. They point to the, literally, a la Elon University, who, which banned the word freshman, they point to the word freshman as having man in it instead of woman. Do you know what a tolerant society you have to live in in order to cite that as your grievance? Do you think that people in Iran who have to, women in Iran who have to wear hijabs, who have a much younger age of criminal responsibility than men, who have to have four witnesses in court when they are accusing someone of raping them, do you think that they would rather live in their society or in the United States that is supposedly so patriarchal that where we call the first years in college freshmen? I mean, it's absurd. We have no sense 
sense of how privileged and lucky we are. And the same is true when people talk about life as a game. And the fact that we live in this culture where people are coming to see corruption as a good thing shows how ignorant we are as to how dangerous and awful corruption really is. And going back to this utilitarian argument, being honest not only precludes you from having bad things happen to you or having your poor consequences catch up with you, but it really does make you a better, fuller person. I think that the definition of sanity is being all of yourself all of the time to everyone. And when you are a liar or when you cheat, it's impossible for you to be authentic because you're living this double life where you have to figure out how to play the game well in different situations, how to finesse, how to work your way in and out of situations. And that must be incredibly mentally and emotionally exhausting. And it also does not lead to having authentic, genuine interpersonal relationships and an authentic, genuine character. And what's also so sad about those who just finesse and BS and cheat their way through life is that they can never really have true pride in their accomplishments. I think they know deep down, they have to know deep down, that they are fraudulent. And for those who have, and I'm sure there are many in the audience, who have worked hard and really gotten things on their own merit, you and I know what an amazing feeling and fulfilled feeling that is that those individuals will never experience. And finally, they miss out on the joy of admiration. Not just admiration of yourself, but admiration of other people. When you behave ethically and you see other people behaving ethically, you get the gift of being able to admire them. And it's just one of the greatest things in life to really have role models that you look up to and you aspire to. It's just so life enriching. And I think about that guy who is bragging about cheating. He looks at other people who are cheating. He may admire their accomplishments, but he doesn't admire them. And they certainly don't admire him. And what a sad thing in life to miss out on. Thank you very much for joining us today. I hope that you enjoyed that. And please, uh, just as a reminder, to subscribe to this channel. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter at uh, Twitter, I said that kind of oddly, at Julie R. Hartman. And remember that each of our thoughts, choices, and actions shape who we are. So let's think clearly, choose wisely and act with principle and determination. Take care.